A series on uh, preferences versus core values, uh, how to maintain healthy relationships with others is what I've finally zeroed in on calling this. Uh, relationships are real important. Um, how we get along with each other is vital, and it is the key to walking in the fullness and the fulfillment of the favor of God. You know, when you're born again, God has preordained for you to have favor. Amen? Amen. And God, we are here for the purpose of winning the world to Jesus. If that was not the case, then when you got born again, God would just bring you on to heaven. Now, there's no, no real reason to be here, except we're here. Uh, of course, we're here to enjoy life. We're here to, to have fun. We're here to, to love one another. But we're here to reach out to a hurting world. We're here to reach the unreached and tell the untold. And that is our primary purpose for being here. We need to always, for, uh, always forget, always remember that, never forget that, that we have a purpose for being here. We're not just here just to grow a garden. We're not just here to sell insurance. We're not here just to work on cars. We're here because they're hurting people and they need to hear about Jesus. And we need to keep that in, in our in our focus as as we go. Hebrews chapter 1 is the kind of the, the core scripture for this. Verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author of, and finisher of our faith. So here, the writer of Hebrews, a lot of people believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I'm not, I'm not sure for sure who did. It's quite possible that Paul did. But whoever wrote the book of Hebrews basically sums up that in chapter 11 that, uh, we, need, that, that we need to look at those that walk by faith and talks about everything happens by faith. By faith this happened. By faith that happened. By faith... They stopped the mouths of lions by faith. All of these things happen in one verse that says, without faith, it's not possible to please God. So everybody say, without faith, without faith. It, is impossible it is impossible to please God. Please God. So what pleases God is not just what we do, it's what we believe. Because if we believe in Him, if we have faith in Him, then we're going to do the right thing. Right believing produces right actions. The problem with a lot of religion is that they try to produce actions and God just says simply believe. If we believe in Him, then we will do what's right. If you really believe in God, then you're going to do what pleases Him. If you really love God, then you're going to be eager to please Him. Amen? And so in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's talking about the people that have gone before us and set the example of walking by faith. It says, let us lay aside every weight, or best say every weight, every weight, and the sin which so easily besets or ensnares us. Now, I've heard preachers say that that means you've got to get the sin out of your life, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't get the sin out of your life. I think we should. But what is the sin that so easily ensnares us? Well, if you look at it in the context of chapter 11 and chapter 12, the sin that easily ensnares us or besets us is that of not believing God. It's the sin of not walking by faith. That is the, the common sin. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will come to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment, of sin because you have not believed. So the sin that the Holy Spirit is here to convict us of is not just the sin of adultery or the sin of lying or stealing or killing or all those things. And they're, they're, those are bad things. We shouldn't do them. But the real root is not believing God. Because, again, when we have the right belief, we'll have the right actions. And so that's the key. The sin that easily besets us is the sin of not walking by faith. And he says to lay that aside and run with patience. Everybody say patience. Patience. 
You know, I, I have discovered <clears throat> it takes patience. Our walk with the Lord is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Amen. It, is, it is a long distance endurance race. And it takes patience. Amen? It, you know, they, they had a Kentucky Derby yesterday. That, that's, a, that's a race. We have a race, but our race is not just an event on a day. Our race is a lifetime. And we have a, a plan that God has for us. It is our race, our path, our lane to walk in. My lane to walk in is different from Vernon's. Now, it combines when we get together at church. We come together as one, as many coming together as one, even though we all have our own unique walk with the Lord. But we come together as a church as one. And we bring all of our differing gifts and abilities and strengths and, and weaknesses. We all come together and we strengthen one another as one. Amen? But my walk is different from Janita's. My walk is different from Jean's. We each have our own unique plan that God has for us. And we have to look unto Jesus. He is the author and finisher. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. is the author, the author and finisher of what? of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now why is that important? Because it is faith that we need. Amen? Because it's faith that we, it, it's faith that changes us. It's faith that connects us to God. It's faith that pleases God. So we need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then it goes on, and, it's, and I'm not going to read all of it, but it starts talking about uh, considering him that we've not resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. And then it starts talking about the chastening of the Lord. And, and it goes from there, and, and the chastening of the Lord, even though it may not be pleasant to our flesh, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, the Bible says. And then it goes on, and it ultimately ends up saying in verse uh, 14, it says, pursue peace. Everybody say, pursue peace, pursue peace. with all people. Say that with all people. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is not saying that if you don't live a holy lifestyle, you won't see God. This is saying that if we don't live a holy or righteous lifestyle, the people we're pursuing peace with are not going to see Jesus in us. So we need to live right, not because we're you know self-righteous or or arrogant, or anything like that. We're no better than anybody else. We just have Jesus. What makes us better is Jesus, not us. Amen? Mm -hmm. And we need to live in a way that shows Jesus to the world. But this whole chapter here, if you, if you understand it correctly, all of this is leading up to our goal, our plan. The plan that God has for your life involves other people. Amen? He hasn't called you to go live on the top of a mountaintop and, and just be separate from, from everybody and, and just have, you know, I, I had a friend that when I was on staff at Lakewood and uh, Brother Leonard Harden was the, uh, the administrator of the church. He was, he was a, Brother Leonard, he's in heaven now, but he was a great man. He was an amusing person, very unique individual. He had been an executive for AT&T uh, or Southwestern Bell, whatever it was back at that time. And uh, he, had, he had been very high up in the company and, and uh, had a great business background, but had a real heart for God. And so he became the administrator for the church. And uh, a, a young man that, that, you know, kind of one of my contemporaries in the church, it, we were in Brother Leonard's office and we were just kind of talking. And my friend was saying, Brother Leonard, he said, I, I'm just, man, I'm so in love with Jesus. He said, I, I just want to get closer and closer to God. He said, I want to just... I want to just get up on top, get get a cabin up on top of a mountain and just do nothing but spend time with Jesus all day long. I, I just want to I want more of Him. I, I and, and Brother Leonard was just kind of standing there with his arms crossed. Says, "Yes, brother. If you if you knew him, he kind of tell you, yes, brother, yes, brother. Wouldn't that be precious?'" And he's going on and on. I, I just want to be with the Lord. And Leonard says, "Yes, brother. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be precious? Of course, the whole world's going to hell, but wouldn't that be wonderful?" <laughs> And, and we just, I just cracked up. 
Because we have a purpose for being here. Yes, we need to spend time with Jesus. Yes, we need to spend time on the mountaintop worshiping him. But don't forget that we're here for a purpose. That purpose is to bring Jesus to the world. Amen. Amen. You're the Jesus that the world will see. Jesus has walked on the earth. He gave his life for us. He ascended. He was crucified, died, was raised from the dead. He's ascended to the Father. He is in heaven. We are now the Jesus that the world sees. And chapter 12 of Hebrews teaches us how to reach the world. And it's by how we relate to one another. We are to pursue peace with all people. Amen? One thing that you have to understand, you cannot convert an enemy. We can only convert friends. Amen? So whenever possible, in another place it says, whenever possible, walk at peace with people. Now, we do understand that, that there are guidelines that we have to walk by. We cannot compromise our core values. We have to be committed and, and, and convicted of our core values. But we'll talk about that in a minute. But in chapter 12, it talks about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God has a plan for your life, and it's mapped out a lane for you to walk in that if you'll look unto Jesus, he'll see to it that you fulfill that plan and that plan involves reaching other people for Jesus. Amen? Now, you may, not everybody's called to be uh, in the office of an evangelist, but everybody is called to do the work of an evangelist. Everyone is. Amen? Amen. Every one of you has a sphere of influence. I mean, it, even if it's just happy, the dog. I mean, you know, you, everyone influences somebody. Amen? <laughs> we all have friends. We all have people that, that we work with, that we hang around with, people that we see. You have a sphere of influence, and God has a plan for you to impact the people that are around you. And so chapter 12 teaches us that, and it involves the chasing of the Lord. And, and the, the Lord showed me that when I was raising my daughters, Crystal will be 39 this year. It's hard to believe. Rachel's getting old, you know. Uh, she's got a birthday coming up. And it's a big one. Uh, that's all I'll say. She's not here to defend herself, but it's a big one, I'm telling you. And so Crystal will be 39. Bethany is 34. And But when we were raising our daughters, I chastened my kids. I, I, I disciplined them. But I did not discipline my children so that I would love them. I already loved them. I disciplined my children so that you would love them because I wanted them to grow up and have favor in the world and be able to be successful. You know, part of the problems that we're living in, the, in, in, the, in the world that we're living in today is we have a couple of full-blown generations that have grown up without discipline in their lives. <clears throat> there was psychiatrists and doctors that wrote books back in the 60s that said you shouldn't spank your kids, you shouldn't discipline, you should only reason with them, and you should only speak nice things over them. And, and I, believe in all, I believe all that. I believe that you should reason with your kids. I believe you should speak good words over them. And I think that we need to be careful as we chase and as we learn about discipline, and we're going to talk about that some today because we're talking about how we relate as a family. But discipline as... It really and, and truly, as a loving family, discipline is not just punishment. It's training. We don't just punish our kids. Even, even though sometimes it may appear that it's punishment, it's really training. We're not just punishing your children. We're not a penitentiary. We're a training center. As a family unit, your family is not a prison. It's a training center. So your objective is to train your children so that they grow up with favor on their lives. Because when you, grow, when you train children to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, please, thank you, all these things that, that we teach our children to do, the proper manners, proper etiquette, how to get along with one another, that is for one purpose. That is not so that I will love my kids. I already love them. That's so that other people will love them so that they can have favor and do what God's called them to do. So God chastens us, not so that he'll love us. He, there's nothing you'll ever do that will ever make God stop loving you. He loves you. Everybody say, he loves me. He loves me. You're the apple of his eye. He's got your picture on his refrigerator. Amen? <laughs> He's got your picture in his wallet. 
Everywhere he goes, he talks about you because you're the apple of his eye. Every one of us. The, he, we have God's attention. We have his love. He doesn't chasten us so that he'll love us. He chastens us so that we love each other and so that other people love us. He chastens us, first of all, so that our families will love us. I have to know how to behave so that Rachel will respond properly to me. I learned that a long time ago. Amen? There are certain things I know that if I do them, I won't get a favorable response. I won't say what they are, but there's a few of them, and I've got them ingrained into my head, I'm telling you. I've learned some things, and, and you know, when you first get married, you don't always know what the rules are. There's not a book about all that. I mean, there's books about it, but it's not, they're, they're not conclusive, I can tell you that. There's things that we have to learn because everybody's unique, everybody's individual. There's things that I, I learned I shouldn't say to Rachel because there are things that, that hit close to home for her. There's things that she shouldn't say to me because there's things that hit close to things in my life. And so we have to learn how to get along with one another. Amen? And God chastens us. He, what that literally means, it doesn't mean he whips us. The, the good news is the, in Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says that the chastisement for our peace was upon Jesus, not on us. The, ch the chastening of punishment for our sins that, that brought us back to peace with God is on Jesus. That's not on us. When we're talking about the chastening of the Lord, we're not talking about the, the punishment for your sins because that was on Jesus. We're talking about the chiseling and the training and the instructing to teach you how to get along with each other, how to get along with your family, how to get along with the church and how to get along with the world. We have four areas of relationship. First one is how to get along with God. Everybody say, how to get along with God. Get along with God. The second one is how to get along with my family. Everybody say, how to get along with the church. That's other believers. And then how to get along with the world. Amen? You know, the sad thing is that, that there is a lot of discord in the church. I heard a story about a guy that, that, that was on a deserted island and he had been lived there for 20 years. He'd lived on a de deserted island by himself. I guess by definition that would make it by himself if he's on a deserted island. And so someday, one, one day an a airplane's flying over and he sees some, you know, some activity down on this island. So he sends a boat there and they go and they rescue this guy. And they're just amazed. He's built, there, there are a couple of huts and there's a you know, different couple of shacks and different things. He had built his own little kind of looked like a little village there. And they asked him, he said, what, what, what have you done here? And they said, oh, you know, I, I just a long time ago decided I needed to live like I was in civilization. So I built things. He said, this building over here, was, was that's my house. He said, I, and I lived in this house. This one over here is the grocery store. I, I, I went, as I stored things up, I put them in there. And that, I went grocery shopping every couple of days and, and took care of everything, brought that to my house. And, and this, other, this one over here, they said, well, what's that one over there? He said, that's my church. He said, I went there and I worshiped every Sunday and, and a couple of nights a week, I'd have worship services, just me and the Lord, had a great time. I said, man, that's, that, in, in fact, I, I owe my faith to, to everything. That's how I was able to survive all this. I said, well, that's, that's amazing. So what's that one over there? He said, oh, well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> Even church hoppers on a deserted island, that's pretty bad. Yeah. But the problem is we have a lot of people that, that think that all they're here to do is criticize other believers. Now, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying that is a situation. God has not called anyone. I, I've actually heard people get on the radio and television and say, my ministry is to point out the, the faults of every other minister." And, and I'm thinking, no, that's not your ministry. That's the devil's job. The devil is the accuser of the brethren, not me, not you. It's not our job to, to find fault with other people. Our job is to pray for one another. Our job is to love one another. Our job is to pursue peace with one another. Amen? Amen. So we talked about the chastening of the Lord is, is a good thing. It is primarily the instruction. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture, everybody say all Scripture, is God breathed. It's inspired of God. When you read the Bible, you're taking in the breath of God. 
When in Genesis, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. When you read the word, God's breathing the breath of life into you. Amen? Mm -hmm. So all scripture is God breathed. It's inspired of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. doctrine. For, reproof, for reproof. Correction. Correct. And instruction in righteousness. Now, doctrine is what we believe. Reproof is what is the belief that becomes a conviction. It is something that is proved to us to the point that it is a conviction in us. It's not, I don't just believe this. This is a conviction of my life. There's some things that need to be a conviction in your life. Amen? And then correction, that's correction. That's, you know, if I'm going the wrong way and God says go over here, go over there. Now, you would think that that's the one that, that pertains to chastening, but it's not. The word chastening in that scripture is the word instruction in righteousness. The word for instruction literally means chastening. It is chastening or instruction in what? In righteousness. So God instructs us. We're in a training center where we are learning what it means to be the righteousness of God. And that's what empowers us to get along with one another. Because if I look at Zane like he's the righteousness of God, instead of like he's a sinner, then he and I have a common ground to get along with. Amen? I look beyond his faults. And hopefully he looks beyond my faults. And I've got plenty. Amen? <laughs> we look to one another, instead of looking to one another as just horrible people, we look to, pe to one another as the redeemed. We've been bought. We've been purchased. We're changed. We are new creations. We're the righteousness of God. God is chastening us and changing and molding the way we think to look at one another as righteousness and even to look at sinners in the world as ones that have the hope of righteousness for their lives because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? So even the worst sinner that you know, the worst sinner that you can think of, there's still hope for them. Paul was, used to be Saul of Tarsus. He was one of the primary Pharisees that went about persecuting the church and, and actually was involved in Stephen's stoning to death. And so Paul, when, when they stoned Stephen in the book of Acts, they, the Bible says that they laid their cloaks at the feet of Paul or Saul. He was one of the Pharisees that, was, that oversaw that. And he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. Now, that's about as low as you can get. Amen? He was on his way to persecute Christians, and Jesus appeared to him. So even the worst sinner that you know, there's still hope. Amen? Amen. And so we need to remember that. We need to look at that. So we, we talked about the four different ways that we get along. Our easiest relationship is our relationship with God. Everybody say, with God. The reason that's the easiest is God's perfect. We don't have to straighten him out. There's nothing to do with God that's not good. Amen? Amen. So it's easy to relate to someone that's, that's always good. And not only is he perfect, he's not just perfect in a self-righteous kind of way. He's perfect in a giving, loving way. He's perfect in his love for us. So you can't help but, if you, the more you get to know God, you can't help but relate to him properly. And he's changed us to be in his image. So that's the easiest relationship, but we do need to work on that. The second one is our families. Everybody say our families. Amen. And these are in priority. Your first priority is your relationship with God. If you don't relate right with God, you won't relate properly with your family and you won't relate properly with the church and you won't relate properly with the world according to God's plan. So God's first, family's the second, the church, the body of believers, our relationship, how we relate to the body of Christ is third. And then from there, we springboard into how we relate properly with the world and share Jesus with them. Amen? Amen. So the four things that we use, the four methods of, of how we get along in our relationships with one another is number one, debating. Everybody say debating. debating. Negotiating. Negotiating. Submitting. Submitting. And rejecting. These four things, these are four instruments that we use in our relationship. We only debate our core values. We negotiate everything else. Amen? 
Some people think everything is a core value. And that's part of the problem of our society is that we're living in, a, in generations, multiple generations that have not been properly disciplined. So they think everything is a right. They think everything is owed to them. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just saying that's, that's the reality of, of the society that we're living in. And it's a worldwide problem. But particularly in this country, it, there, we, we have people that think everything is owed to them. Everything is a right. There's no winner. There's no loser. Everybody's a winner. Every, I mean, they don't, don't even keep scoring sports. And everybody gets a trophy. Everybody wins. And, and you know, I, I believe in being positive. I believe in being, in, in being reinforcing of positive things with our children. But there needs to be discipline. There needs to be a training of how we are responsible. And not everything is owed to us. Amen? Amen. And so because of that, people think that because everything is owed to them, everything is a core value. Well, I have a right for that. I have a right for a college degree. I have a right for this and that, whatever it is. Well, you name it, I have a right for it. And so they don't negotiate it. It's a right. If it's a right, they have to debate it. So everything becomes a debate. There's no give and take. Nobody's willing to compromise on anything. Nobody's willing to give in in any area because everything is owed to them. Everything is a debate. So that's the society that we're living in. But that's not us. Everybody say, that's not me. We can't change the world unless we change ourselves. And so that's why God disciplines and chastens us so that we learn how to walk in patience, how, do we, how to have endurance, how to keep our eyes on Jesus, how to love and prefer one another and how to be givers and not just takers. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so we debate our core values. Our core values are the things that are non-negotiable. There are some things that are just non-negotiable. The fact that Jesus is my Lord and Savior is not negotiable. That is a core value. Amen? Whatever, God, and by, by definition, anything that is one of God's core values needs to be my core values. God is love. Everybody say, God is love. God is love. So loving the world, or the people in the world, is one of God's core values. So that needs to be one of my core values. That's not negotiable. Amen? Mm -hmm. We love everybody. I don't care what color they are. I don't care how poor they are, how rich they are how what they believe, how sinful they are, we love everybody. Now, some people you have to love from a distance, but we love everybody. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, we love everybody. Amen. And I'm determined that our church is going to be a church that loves everybody. When somebody comes in this church, I don't care what color they are, I don't care how rich they are, how poor they are, whatever their background is, whether you understand them, whether you agree with them or not, Love is not always about what you agree with. Love is what you believe. Mm -hmm. And I choose to love everybody. I may not agree with everything everybody says, but I'm going to love them. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what this church is going to do. We're going to be lovers. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so that's a core value. Everything else, anything that's not a core value, we negotiate. We don't have to debate everything. In a negotiation the objective is for everyone to win. In a debate, the objective is for me to win. Amen? And then sometimes we submit. There are some people that we're called to submit to. We're, we're, the Bible says to submit to those that are over us in the Lord. As I follow Jesus, submit to me. Amen? And then the last one is rejection. Sometimes the most powerful word in a relationship is goodbye. Because... There's no neutral relationship. Any relationship that draws you away from God, you can love them, you can have love for them, you can try to minister to them, but that doesn't mean that you have to stay close to them because if they're drawing you away from God, they're dangerous for you. Amen? Amen. And so sometimes rejection is part of it. Now, in the family, with the, last week we talked about husband and wives, and uh, we talked about how that uh, it, the, the husband is the head of the house, not in a domineering way, not in a I'm better than you way, not in a I'm smarter than you way. I mean, there, there are th things that Rachel is smarter than me in, and there are things I'm smarter than her in. And so we work together as a team, and we submit to one another, and I've learned to listen to her. I've learned that when she says things, I need to pay attention. 
And that, that's something every husband needs to learn. If you're a husband, you need to know that you need to pay attention to your wife. Sometimes Rachel has said things to warn me of things that would happen, and if I didn't listen to them, bad things happen because she sees things that I don't see. And so I need to pay attention to them. But as, as a husband, I'm responsible for the direction our family goes in. I'm responsible for loving my wife. In Ephesians, the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And then it says, husbands, love your wives. We talk about how the, that most people look at women as the nurturing, nurturers, the, the providers of love, and men are just the ones that go out and bring home the bacon. That's kind of a traditional worldview. But that's not what the Bible says. Now, it is true that men are to work, so are women to work. If you don't believe women work, Read Proverbs 31. That's a working woman. Amen? So everyone works. Work is not male or female. Work is everybody. Amen? Whether you have a job or not, work is your purpose. Work is what gives a direction to your life, a purpose, a reason to get out of bed. So work is important. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says that he that doesn't work should not eat. Now, it's one thing if you cannot work. There are people that are unable to work, and that's different. But if you're capable of working and the work is available, then if you don't work, you don't eat. That's just what the Bible says. The Bible says that a man that doesn't provide for his own family and his own household is worse than an infidel and has departed from the faith. And so what, whether we provide for our families or not is important. That's an important thing. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that is one of our core values. But the man's primary responsibility is not just bringing home the bacon. The man's primary responsibility is to love. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So as a husband, my, prim my first and foremost job in my home is to love my wife. And by Default, when I love my wife, then I love my children because they came out of my wife. Amen? Mm -hmm. So a husband's first and foremost job is to love his wife. Amen? When a husband loves his wife properly, submission is not a matter of dom domination. Submission is a matter of, of working and cooperating together. I love Rachel and she submits to my love. Amen? The more I love her, the more I show her my love, the more it is natural for her to submit to my love because my love is always looking out for what's best for her even over me. That's what love does. That's the difference between love and lust. Lust looks at somebody as what can they give to me? What can they do to satisfy me? Love looks at somebody like what can I do for them? And husbands, love your wives. Amen? So when the husband loves his wife like Jesus loved the church, <clears throat> Jesus doesn't yell and scream and pitch fits and, and demand our submission. He simply loves us and we submit to him. Amen? Now the word does say to submit to him. He is the Lord. And we will honor him as the Lord. But the reason we can submit to him so freely is because of how much he loves us. So if you want proper order in the home, it starts with the husband loving the wife. Too often men try to command their wives to submit to them with, before they show them how much they love them. And that's, that's a problem. That causes problems. Because it's hard to submit to somebody when you don't realize that they love you. Amen? Amen. Boy, that's good preaching, Pastor Steve. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then the children. Everybody say children. children. Now, we need to understand that children need to be brought up and in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Why? It's like what we've been talking about. We train and discipline our children. We chasten our children, not so that we can love them, but so other people will love them. And so they'll love each other and they'll love us. Children that are brought up in properly disciplined homes, and I don't mean prison, I mean training centers. I mean loving training centers. Children that are brought up in an environment of love where there is that secure 
understanding that my parents love me. When they're brought up in that environment, they love their parents. They respond by loving their parents. Now, that doesn't mean that there's never any tension. God knows there is tension in homes. Amen? Amen. When you got more than one person in a room, there's going to be tension from time to time. If you and I agree on every single thing and do everything exactly alike, one of us is not necessary. Amen? There's a reason why people are different. There's a reason why people have different tastes and different likings and things like that because it brings variety. We, we complete one another. And sometimes in our completing one another, there's a little bit of tension in the room. And so... When, when we're training our children, remember this. The Bible says that children obey your parents. Well, first of all, let's look at the, uh, what the Scripture says in Proverbs or Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. Y'all get anything out of this? Amen. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. Honor your father and mother. Everybody say, honor my father, honor my father. and mother. Notice it doesn't just say honor your father. It says honor your father and mother. Both parents. The parental unit is one. Father and mother. The Bible says that a husband, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife and those two shall become one flesh. So the mother and father are to be one unit. Amen? In a properly balanced home now none of us are perfect but in a perfect home the mother and father are always as one they function together as a single unit husband and wife mother and father that means when mom says no dad says no when dad says no mom says no they function together as one a lot of times kids will go to one parent and they'll say can i go to the zoo or can i go to the park or whatever it is and that parent will say, no, maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe there's not. But they say no. So what do they do? They go to the other parent. Can I go to the park? Well, what did dad say? He said to come and ask you. And that's not what he said, but that's what they say. What do they do? They, because they have an inkling, they have an idea that maybe this one said no. Maybe the other one will say yes. We all, we all do this and all of our kids do this. They need to learn early on that when mom says no, dad reinforces it. Amen? Because husband and, husband and wife are one flesh. Mother and father are one. Amen? And remember, your discipline, your chastisement in the home is a training center, not a prison. You are to train, the Bible says, to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But it says, honor your father and mother. If I say father and mother. Which is the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with you and you may, be, may live long on the earth. That's, that just reinforces what I'm saying. Honor your father and mother. In other words, receive their training and discipline and honor that, that it may be well with you. Amen? Amen? That you'll have favor. That you'll be able to get along with others. And you live longer. Amen? Amen? That it may be well with you and that your life may live long on the earth. That's the first commandment with promise. Notice it, it, it doesn't say honor your father and mother until you move out or until they die. My dad passed away over almost well, 13 years ago almost. And I still honor him. Now, I don't, after you move out, you grow up, you're not under their authority and dominion anymore, but you honor them. You'll honor your parents for the rest of your life. I still do things and, and honor my dad. He was not perfect. There's only, you know, two people that are perfect I know, me and Vernon. And I wonder about Vernon. But, but no, we, but I honor my parents. My mother and my father, I was very blessed to have two very godly parents. You may say, well, my parents were not very godly. Well, you can still honor them in, in a respectful way. You can still respect and honor them, even in their failures. And, and understand this, none of us are perfect. 
We've all made mistakes. I made mistakes when I was raising my kids. I, I know more about raising kids now than I did when I had them. You know, and so now when my daughters call and ask me for advice, I'm able to give them advice, but I tell, I tell, you know, tell them, I said, look, you know, you're learning how to be a parent, just like I learned how to be a parent with you. I've learned some things because you taught me a lot. And I've learned some things in raising you and training you. And, and thank God you turned out good. But I had to learn these things as I went. And I'm, I'm happy to share. But understand this, you're a learner. Your children are learning how to be your children. You're learning how to be their parents. When you have grandkids, you're going to learn how to be a grandparent. We're learning all the time how to do what we're supposed to do. Amen? And so we train our children, and our children honor us, but even though we make mistakes, our children still honor us because that's biblical. Amen? Amen. So in all the flaws of, and mistakes of your parents, you can still honor them. Amen? And if they were good parents and Thank God you had good parents. If they weren't good parents, then thank God you know the perfect parent. Amen? Amen. Jesus, our Father, Father God, and Jesus, we have the perfect family. We have a perfect father and a perfect brother. Amen? Amen. We, we are now connected to the most perfect family in the universe, Amen. and that's God. Amen? So through God, we can honor our earthly parents, father and mother. Amen? I don't believe that discipline should be just the job of the father. A lot of people think, well, you know, the dad's the disciplinary and the mom's the provider of love. Remember, the father's primary purpose is to provide love. Now, love involves discipline. In fact, one verse says that he that spares the rod hates his son. It doesn't say spoils the son. People misquote that verse. You know, the people, well, what's the Bible? well, the Bible says spare the rod and spoil the child. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says spare the rod. He who spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. No, that's not saying punishment. We think of the rod as, as a punishment. It is a training instrument. Amen. Psalm 23 says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod of God is not something that he beats us with to punish us. It is something that he uses to instruct and train us. Discipline is not punishment. It's training. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says that, that children obey your parents, but then it goes on and says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. I'm getting close to closing. Y'all getting anything out of this? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Children, verse 1, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Everybody say, children, children. obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So here it says, fathers, do not provoke. That word provoke means wrath. And it says, your children to wrath. It's the same word. Fathers, do not wrath your children to wrath. Do not anger your children to anger. Remember, we're training our children to walk in love. Now, love is not just mushy, gooey feelings. Love has guidelines, and, it, and it, sometimes it takes a strong stand for things. And sometimes we have to be real strong in our discipline with our children, ch children to protect them. Not to control them and dominate them, but to protect them. If I, you know, when my child was, was walking towards a, a stove and it, maybe there was a hot burner, if they're reaching up, sometimes you got to spot their hand. You got to train them. You, you got to get their attention. You got to do something to get their attention because what they're doing is about to hurt them. Amen? Now, I would never take my child over to a burning stove and put their hand on the burner and say, now that's, uh, that's what happens when you touch a burning stove. That would be punishment. That would be improper. That's not how we train our kids. Amen? Mm -hmm. 
And we, we act according to what they're doing, but in love. What your children need is to know, first and foremost, that they're loved. All discipline, all proper discipline is an act of love because it's an act of training. Now, are we perfect in that? No, God is. Amen? Amen. There are times that I discipline my children imperfectly, but I love them. And in spite of my faults, I still told them how much I love them. Amen? Amen? And that's what we need to do. Fathers, do not provoke or wrath your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. That word training literally means chastening. Remember, chastening is instructing and training. We're training our children how to behave. So that that promise of that first commandment, that it may be well with thee and your life may be long on the earth. Amen? We train our kids, again, not so that we love them, but so they can get along with one another, so they can get along with the rest of the family, so they can get along with the church and ultimately get along in the world. Amen? We all want our kids to grow up and do better than us. Right? We want them to grow up and go farther, live in a bigger house, drive a better car, drive, have, wear better clothes, do everything and have everything, have it easier than we had it. We want that for our kids. Right? I don't want my kids to learn everything the hard way. I had a friend that, that uh, he was a hard-headed kid when he was growing up, and his dad told him one time, he said, son, you'll never live long enough to learn everything the hard way. <laughs> I don't want my kids to grow up and learn, have to learn everything the hard way. I wanted them to learn from my mistakes just like I learned from my dad's mistakes. Amen? Amen. And we train and we, we discipline, we nurture them, in the goodness of God, we discipline and train them so that they grow up and get along and they honor us. And they, 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 uh, to honor means to fix a high value on something. So when you honor your parents, you're valuing your parents. They're important to us. Amen? Amen. So we bring them up in the nurture and the training and admonition of the Lord. And then remember this, that God's rod, the rod of God is, a, is an instrument of comfort. Psalm 23, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. And I'll close with this. Two instruments that it talks about that comfort us. The rod, that's the discipline, and the staff. A staff is a walking stick that keeps you steady in uncertain places. So along with proper discipline is that knowing that we have a steadiness about us. That in certain times, because we've been properly disciplined, we have that rod, but we also have the staff that keeps us walking properly, keeps us from stumbling when we could fall. Amen? So a properly disciplined child and a properly disciplined Christian is one that's able to stand in the storms of life because we've been trained. Not so God would love us, but so that we can get along with each other and get along with others. Life is a lot easier when you get along with people. Amen? Amen? Life is hard when you don't get along. I mean, I've counseled a lot of people that, you know, that had marriage problems, and marriage is tough when you don't get along. It's hard when everything is good sometimes. But it's real hard when you don't get along. You know, you can not have enough money to pay your bills, but if you still walk in love and get along with each other, you can make it through those storms. Amen? Amen. You can make it through that rod and that staff comfort you, bring you the comfort of knowing that even when you have tough times, the staff keeps you walking when you could stumble. But that staff doesn't work without the rod. They work together. Amen? Amen. That discipline, that training of knowing how to relate, how to get along, keeps you in a place where two people can steady each other. A husband and wife can keep each other from falling. Brothers and sisters can keep each other from falling. The church can keep each other from falling. The rod and the staff. Amen? Amen. And so we not only discipline and train, we also keep our kids walking when life can be tough, when it looks like they could fall. We're not there to criticize them and knock them down. We're there to steady them and be that steadiness for them. Amen? Amen. That bless you today? Hallelujah. But say God is good.